As Martin Luther King Jr. explained in his 1963 letter from Birmingham jail, nonviolent protests create tension between oppressors and the oppressed. During the Children's March, the students faced police threats and violence, and ultimately over 600 students were arrested. This violence served in direct contrast to the peaceful protests of the students, highlighting the cruelty of segregationists. Second, the Children's March revealed that mass nonviolent mobilizations allows for those in a weaker position to dismantle unjust power structures. After the Children's March, city leaders agreed to desegregate business, release all who had been jailed during the demonstrations, and remove the infamous segregationist Bull Connor from his position as Commissioner of Public Safety. Since students were able to band together in a mass movement, they were able to diminish the power of segregationists. With instances of civic engagement like the Children's March, citizens have been able to expand the rights of underrepresented groups. We agree with Michael Carpini, a public policy prof professor from the University of Pennsylvania, who argues that civic engagement refers to individual and collective actions that address public issues through the institutions of civil society. French theorist Alexis de Tocqueville argued that civic engagement played a unique role in American society. Tocqueville established that Americans associated with one another to provide resources for the community, such as education, such as education and medical services. This spirit of association has guided civic engagement throughout American history. Notably, the 19th century temperance movement was the largest and most successful reform movement of the period. Associations like the Women's Christian Temperance Union popularized the movement around the country, which ultimately led to the passage of the 18th Amendment. Furthermore, the 1970s led to a popular anti-war movement gaining traction as many young people and students protested the United States' involvement in the Vietnam War. Organizations like Students for a Democratic Society protested, ultimately leading President Nixon to withdraw American troops from Southeast Asia. Since civic engagement is key for representation, we believe that schools have a responsibility to encourage students to be civically engaged. We agree with the 2018 study conducted by the University of California, Davis, which establishes that students must have the knowledge, the skills, and the access to be civically engaged. First, schools must provide students with the knowledge to become civically engaged by teaching them about their constitutional rights and means to engage with the government. For example, California adopted a history social science framework in 2016 that focuses on teaching history and citizenship. Second, schools must provide students with a platform to develop the skills to become civically engaged. Schools must encourage students to participate in civil discourse and develop the skills for participating in a democracy. For example, the Illinois Civic Missions Coalition introduced an initiative called Democracy Schools that encourages civic engagement through programs like classroom voting. Third, schools must provide the opportunity for students to be civically engaged. This means that the school should take measures to ensure that their students are planning to vote and are willing to participate in local, state, and national affairs. For example, Michigan State University provides campus tent talks where students can debate issues like impeachment and immigration. Civic engagement is necessary for the success of American democracy, and thus we must ensure that youth remain engaged. Thank you. Thank you. So underlying in this, this discussion that we're having is the idea of the, you know, the common good. So I, I'd like you to speak to the notion of what is the common good, and can the common good vary from county to county, state to state, or country to country? I think this question really goes to the heart of issues of federalism and that what should individuals at the national government consider in order to create the common good and how much autonomy should local governments have in order to promote the common good. And I would argue that this onus largely relies in local communities. We can look to a 1999 study by Robert Putnam who argues that civic engagement is most prevalent in local communities and thus the onus should be on local governments to promote the common good in their areas since they know the most about the individuals that constitute the space. I think that currently this is an issue that we are seeing a lot of now during this COVID-19 situation, as many local communities um, uh, are enforcing the stay-at-home orders, uh, some stricter than others. And I believe that uh, it is uh, the na national common good that people stay home. However, it is more of a local and community issue for people being able to go out. So uh, the common good really just depends on the situation. And most of the times it is up to local communities. However, we can see that in certain situations, it should be up to the federal government. 
Furthermore, philosophers like Plato believed that um, contributing to the common good was necessary for a well-functioning democracy. He believed that things like um, associating and contributing and getting involved and active in your community is um, what really drives the success of a democracy. And I think that um, especially during this pandemic and these times that we're in, um, we should really follow um, what Plato said about um, striving towards um, the common good and helping one another get there. I see Mr. Wong is on. Do you have any questions, Mr. Wong? Yes, I do. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 My question, uh, you, you mentioned the uh, protesters uh, against the governor's stay-at-home orders, and you mentioned that um, it, it should be driven by local and community leaders. Well, the, the stay-at-home orders are, are, are driven by the governors, and so and they're statewide orders. And so uh, I want to hear from you whether or not you think a statewide order is appropriate or inappropriate and why. Um, I do believe that statewide orders are actually appropriate because each state currently is experiencing a different amount or different level of the current coronavirus crisis. Um, you can look to states like New York or New Jersey, um, which have a high number of cases, higher than almost countries in the European Union, compared to other states such as um, Minnesota or Illinois that currently are facing a boom in cases, but initially they did not have these many cases. And I do believe that um, as a sort of a federal sort of state, a nation as ourselves, we must re rely on states to maintain their duties and ensure that they create laws that address their own needs. I disagree with my colleague. I believe that statewide orders are far too general and we can see that it's local municipalities that are some being hit harder than others. Looking to a diverse state like California, we see that in the Los Angeles area, and even looking to like Santa Clara County in the Bay Area, we see that those are hot spots across the state, but going up north into the Sierra region uh, and into even the northern parts of our state, we see that there are very few cases uh, ever represented of COVID-19. And so I think that the onus and the burden must not fall on the states, but rather be granted that power to local municipalities in order to better control and govern their individual uh, problems and handle them with local solutions. You discuss what prevents a urban person from going to a rural area and spreading it to the rural area. For this reason, I disagree with both my unit mates. I do think that the federal government's responsibility is to ensure that individuals are not putting others at risk beyond state lines since communities are not isolated in of themselves. They communicate with other people and they interact with others as well. So in this case, when a pandemic is affecting the entire nation, I think the burden uh, falls to the president and the federal government. I agree with Sana. We can see with Operation Gridlock in Lansing, Michigan, um, it brought hundreds of protesters against uh, Governor Whitmer's um, request for lengthening the stay at home order. And we can see that they, um, although they were supposed to stay in their cars, cars in order to prevent the spread, a lot of them ended up getting out of their cars and um, reports were of people handing out flyers, handing out candy and a lot of contact within each other. There was also a Confederate flag scene and there was a lot of hatred and disrespect of the public safety. So I agree with Sana and that there can be a lot of um, outreach to all different parts of the state, regardless of uh, where you are originally from. You talked about civic, Thank you. You talked about civic virtue and civic duty. Do we have a, a civic duty or virtue to be civil disobedient? And if so, do you see yourself at any time stepping in as the Birmingham students did and risk life and limb for a cause? If so, what cause? So Henry David Thoreau, a philosopher, argued that it is the American citizen's duty to be civically disobedient when you feel that your, um, your rights are being violated and civil disobedience is really directly violating the laws that you feel are unjust. And we can see that Martin Luther King Jr. really utilized this and he preached this during his Birmingham um, and Selma marches and bus boycotts. Yeah, I agree with Elena. I think right now it's really important to be uh, civil, civil disobedience in the topic of climate change just because it is such an imposing threat. So I think that one thing that all of us can participate in is the youth climate strike in order to gain, may I finish my thought? In order to gain meaningful legislation uh, for climate action. I thought, you, I thought you all did a wonderful job. I mean, one of the things that um, makes a successful exercise is, is 
us having questions that we don't necessarily get the answer to, we want to talk to you about. And I have a list of questions here that I that I didn't ask, and I wish I could. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, I particularly appreciated your answer to um, my question about the common good, and um, kind of turning on its head a little bit and characterizing it as federalism. So you all did a nice nice job, and, and clearly you're well prepared. So thank you. Mr. Wong, you didn't get a chance to introduce yourself, so why don't you do that and then your comments. All right, thank you. I'm uh, Dan Wong. I'm a retired attorney and, and former judge. I'm also on the National Board of Directors for the Center for Civic Education, and I live in uh, Boise, Idaho. I was able uh, to call in soon enough to hear the entire four-minute presentation and your six minutes of cross-examination questions. I thought you did a very, very good job uh, on the four-minute presentation, and I think you did a, a good job on the cross-examination questions. If there's anything that uh, tests the Constitution, that is a crisis. It could be 9-11, could be Vietnam, it could be COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and clearly uh, you've thought about uh, your constitutional rights and both argue, uh, are arguments on both sides on a constitutional issue of, you know, the stay-at-home orders. I very much appreciated listening to uh, your presentation. Congratulations. Thank you. I'd like to mirror a wonderful conversation. I, I too, have a long list of things I would love to discuss with you about. Uh, it would have been interesting to see how uh, you were touting nonviolence to the forefront as a means of civil disobedience, but one of the strategy of a nonviolent strategy is for violence to be thrust upon you uh, to make clear where the moral high ground is. So it's interesting in prophesizing nonviolence, in a sense, we are encouraging violence. Would have liked to have seen your impression on that. Also, uh, with the, co you know, the whole notion of the COVID-19 protests and everything like that, the protesters out front holding AK-47s, and I'm just wondering your impact on that, your thought on that. Are they holding it because it's a Second Amendment freedom and they're just saying it's a Second Amendment freedom and no different than the freedom I'm looking for now? Or perhaps are they holding it and saying, you know, we're Minutemen, we don't get what we want, we're willing to go violent. So uh, kind of an interesting thought there. I had a great time, uh, you're well versed, the future of our society rests in your hands and I feel good about that because you'll enter a world I'm not privileged to enter and I feel it's in good hands. To your coach, thank you very much for bringing your students to us and for the parents who are secretly standing behind the computer or behind the screen or trying to listen through the door with a stethoscope. Thank you very much for working with your students through this. Uh, our future's in good hands. Good job. Thank you.